morning, everybody. I think it's actually good afternoon. Good afternoon. We'll try that again. It's a do-over. Um, I'm Andrew Seeley, Executive Vice President at the Woodrow Wilson Center. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Czech and Slovak Freedom Lecture um, on behalf of Jane Harmon, our President and CEO, who's actually on her way back from Europe at the moment. Um, this event is a cherished tradition at the Wilson Center and grew out of a deep engagement by the Center's scholars with Eastern and Central Europe, which continues today. Um, it commemorates the inspiring struggle for freedom by the Czech and Slovak peoples. Once a year, it brings influential speakers from the Czech Republic and Slovakia to the center, such as today's feature speaker. Um, the lecturer series, who I think is known to many of you uh, from his time in Washington. Uh, the lecture series has given the Wilson Center and its Global Europe program the privilege of hosting, among others, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, the solidarity leader and prominent newspaper e editor Adam Michnik, the former Czech President Václav Klaus, former Ambassador Michael Zantowski, and leading Czech scholar, sociologist, and theologian Professor Thomas Halleck. Over the years, the lecture has made important contributions to the Washington policy discourse and debate. I want to take a moment to recognize our partners for this event, the Embassy of the Slovak Republic, and we're very honored to have the Ambassador here with us today. Thank you, Ambassador. The Embassy of the Czech Republic, and we're very pleased to have the Ambassador with us here today as well. Friends of Slovakia, we have a number of people with us from Friends of Slovakia. And the American Friends of the Czech Republic, a number of representatives as well. Thank you. This is now the 17th annual Czech and Slovak Freedom Lecture. We're grateful for your support today and for the ongoing partnership to all four of those partners. Um, now, Ambassador, Ambassador Kacher, a former ambassador of Slovakia to the United States. Many of you know him because he served a number of years in Washington earlier, but he has served all over the world. He is currently the Slovakian ambassador to Hungary. He has long and illustrious career as a diplomat, including negotiating Slovakia's ascension to NATO and serving as the president of the Slovak Atlantic Commission. It's my honor to welcome Ambassador Radislav Kacer to the podium and Dr. Christian Osterman, the director of our Global Europe program as well. Thank you. We'll come up here and, and Ambassador Kacer. It's 10, 10 minutes in the afternoon, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mr. Vice President, thank you very much for your very, very kind introduction. Uh, dear ambassadors, dear friends, uh, it's good to be back, I have to tell you. It's good to be back here. I used to sit in the room where previous speakers spoke. Um, I was always delighted that uh, both friends uh, they introduced uh, this tradition because I think we should keep reminding ourselves what the transatlantic bond means in particular for Czechs and Slovaks, but for all nations of Central Europe in general. And here your role as friends is irreplaceable. Now, I'm in a little bit awkward position since I always used to sit on the other side and it's always strange when you change uh, onto the other side of the fence. And, I'm, and I want to tell you that I'm, and I'm humbled, I'm really humbled, and I'm honored, uh, because when I remember people who spoke before me, many of those were not only um, um, a true intellectuals, I'm just a, a country boy that shoots the animals on the weekends and, and is fishing and hunting. Um, so um, I'm humbled, you know. Uh, but also the politicians who, who who were physically transatlantic, like Mad Madeleine Albright. Who could be more Atlantic like Madeleine? Uh, so to me, this is a hard role. Before I say anything, I want to thank you, because if we spoke of, of the bond and relationship, it's you in your families uh, who, who are very much in this. And I see uh, Julie here, uh, many of you, uh, they were people who sometimes chosen come to the United States as migrants, and sometimes this was not the choice. Uh, you just had to, like you, right, older. Uh, and then all of your time were thinking how to, you know, how how to how to make world better. And this is the community which is meeting here, who are true Americans who were migrants, many of you, in the second, in the first, whatever generation, but there were those who were making America great all the time. And you succeeded. I think this is a great nation. Uh, 
which helped many times us, but it was often through you and, and through your dedication and through your bond. So I want to thank you for that. That transatlantic relations, there is a true bond for Slovaks and for Czechs. It started 150 years ago, roughly. And this was driven mainly as an economic migration. We should remember, because now migration is a popular theme, I think, on vague topic. Everybody talks of migration in the liberal world, uh, often with a strange connotation. But this was economic migration within some parts of Austro-Hungarian Empire. This was a very hard living, uh, northern eastern parts of Slovakia. People were dying of hunger, and they were leaving in uh, great numbers to find better place for living and more decent place for life. I recommend reading on this, uh, if we are soaked with migrant debate today, uh, the book written by an Austrian author, which is called The American Empire. We should remind ourselves how life was hard and how uh, many of your ancestors who were coming to the United States, uh, uh, what a harsh conditions they went through uh, to get here, uh, how much they were cheated, mistreated, hated coming here, under evaluated articles in in big papers, how these strangers from that God forgotten corner of the world, they cannot accommodate, they will never be true Americans. You know, but who can be more true Americans like you are in this room? So uh, that bond started 150 years ago, mainly for economic reasons, and these were economic migrants. But things were turning on, there was a lot of um, additional political migration. You see austro hungarian Empire to the end uh, of its life was turning strange. In Austria, uh, life was no, not very good for Czechs. In Slovakia, uh, Helvidek at the time, uh, hungerization hit um, um, our nation very badly. Many people were leaving for political reasons. Well, strangely, they didn't find the safe haven in Soviet Union uh, or in China, nor in India, uh, nor in Brazil at the time, but they found it here. Um, United States gave them the chance, gave them the opportunity, and gave them the freedom uh, to find self-fulfillment to contribute to the nation, but also to remember how to pay back and how to give back to their nations, to the original nation. And here I want to come to the point which I think is for Slovaks and Czechs absolutely crucial. And actually I'm coming in the time which is very good to remind those two things. First, I want to remember day 1918, 28th of October, we celebrated uh, a few days ago, a few weeks ago, Prieshnok Czechoslovakia. And then I'd like to stop by by 17th of November, which was yesterday. In my life, to me, those two dates are the most important dates uh, for Slovaks, and I believe also for Czechs. Um, in Strange, we are also in a building which is called Woodrow Wilson Center. So 1918, where more physical we could get uh, to remember uh, that year and in October of uh, 1918 uh, when Czechoslovakia was born. So 1918, Czechoslovakia was born on the ashes of Austro-Hungarian Empire, and I think this was an excellent move. I think Slovaks, they should, uh, they should celebrate uh, this date, not as a creation of Czechoslovakia, but as a national survival day because if this was not happening, I'm afraid today, um, Slovaks would be only a small folkloric ensemble around Tatras and would be gone uh, as the nation. But I don't want to talk about that. You know, I want to talk about how important at some point of history are two things. First of all, friends and allies who are on your side and who could help you. And second, it's the role of elite. And elite, I mean, not those who might have the thickest pocket uh, but those who's got the best brain and the most courage and the best vision to carry on uh, people uh, for better times. Uh, if that was not the United States uh, of 1918 uh, and carriage, uh, courage of Woodrow Wilson uh, in his smart policy, uh, Czechoslovakia would, would not be born. This was a true success story in the 20s uh, in, in Europe. We tend to forget that Czechoslovakia, as it was born with the assistance of Czech and Slovak elites migrating here, having the vision, assisting their home nation, and creating this alliance uh, and bond uh, with American government, 
nothing would have happened. The project what they created was a big one because in 20s and 30s, Czechoslovakia was the most successful democracy in the region. And actually, you know, unfortunately, maybe this was the only true liberal democracy in the region. We tend to forget about that. Uh, we can feel that heritage actually today, if you provoke me with your questions, I don't want to go too far. I'm still ambassador on governmental payroll, so I have to be cautious how far I go. But I may get closer to what I mean, that we can feel that type of heritage even today in Central Europe, uh, all those credentials. Um, role of elites that I already mentioned. Uh, if this was, this was not driven by referendum. If you would have done referendum in Feldivec uh, in 1918, I, I don't think this would be for creation of Czechoslovakia. So would it mean it was wrong or anti-democratic? I don't think so. Um, so role of elites is irreplaceable. However they are hated today, however they are distrusted today, whatever strange world we're going to which trust in lies more or a loud speech uh, than uh, a vision uh, and the, well now I could say, uh, the experience of gray hair. So I just, uh, this is a fake, you know. I'm <laughs> I just have the gray beard. Uh, it's not corresponding with that experience yet. I have to wait for Yura. Yura has got the credibility of, of that gray beard. Uh, so uh, this was about 1918. Uh, we split in uh, later on, uh, but you know I don't want to go there. I want to stop at the yesterday uh, celebration, which equally important. And here, judge which was more. Uh, more important by the creation of Czechoslovakia in 1918, again, Slovaks and National Survival Day, or 1988, uh, 1989, the Velvet Revolution. Strange, revolution and velvet. Revolutions are rarely velvet. Pavel Demich said yesterday, good reminder, that for Slovaks and Czechs, revolution was velvet, uh, divorce was velvet. How civilized, you know, and how working. But 89, to me, was a breakthrough where we got rid of something which was so unnatural for Czech and Slovak and which was so much contrasting with democratic credentials of 20s and 30s uh, we went through. We got rid of 40 years of communism. Uh, this was a reminder that uh, however tough regime was, uh, whatever smart controls they got, whatever powerful uh, KGB-like uh, uh, secret service uh, was there uh, whatever security uh, or on his, you know, like his cage where the squirrel is running around all the time uh, to have the little uh, nut at the end, nothing can stop the freedom. Uh, I think this is a eternal quest uh, and it's very much um, in our heart and in our mind that uh, freedom is more uh, than anything else. We broke free, communism was gone, I'm still having, uh, well, I wear my father's watch. He died three years ago. And I remember in the summer uh, 89, and still was communism on and strong. Uh, with Tina, uh, we were having a graduation party in our house. And uh, we were freshly graduated from the university, still with the state exam for Marxism and Leninism, though we are organic chemistry uh, graduates. Uh, and uh, I remember, like, at the end, we got a couple of glasses of wine. Uh, Dad was sitting sad, and I said, you know, what's, what's with you? And he said, you know, look, um, nobody ever was in the Communist Party in our family. Um, but I have to tell you that you are very young. You are you're very smart. You are bright. Um, I just want to tell you that if you join, because it will help you to advance you in your career. Uh, we, will not, we will not be mad about you. Don't, don't worry about it if, if you decide to do so. And I was very touched, uh, to tell you. Uh, um, and I told him, Dad, you know, and what is wrong with your life? Uh, maybe you could have done uh, professionally more, but you know, you got your family, you got people who like you. Isn't this more uh, than uh, you know buying a ticket uh, to something which you don't know what? You know you sh you should be proud about your life. And uh, and I s and I told him you know and this is going to go. 
It's all unnatural. This is so strange. This is so weird. This cannot last forever. And he turned very sad and he said, you know what? I was thinking this all of my life. And I was hoping this for all of my life. But you don't understand how strong this is. And you, don't, you have no clue how long this can take. You know, maybe this will be here forever. I don't know. Well, I move on. Uh, my few months on, I was sitting in the barracks with the Red Barrett as a conscripted junior lieutenant, and it fell down like house of cards. And I was sitting at the staff meeting somewhere in beginning of December, mid-December, where there were some hawks who said, well, what we are doing here in the barracks, you know, we should go out and, and show these students who's got the upper hand here, uh, what we are here for. And I, I, this was a nightmare. I was sitting like in the cinema. You watch something completely senseless going on. And uh, at the end of the meeting, I raised my head and I said, you know, come on, you come, you, what, you, what, where the fuck do you want to go, you know? These are my schoolmates. These are your kids. These are your brothers and sisters. Wha what would you like to go? What would you like to do out there with this? Um, this was, I remember still this because I thought um, as I finished, and you know, there are sometimes things where your um, muscles kick in first before your brain. And then your brain kicks in and said, oh, Jesus Christ, if this is going to reverse, I'll see my daughter on her weddings next time, maybe if I'm lucky. But we were all lucky, and life changed, and it changed a lot. Uh, we came to the new world. Many of you were part of this change. Uh, and, uh, well, here I would stop with those two anniversaries, and I'll move on to one thing. Because, you know, when we look, uh, what is the world of today? Is in these Huxley terms, uh, new brave world. When we moved on to this new brave world after 89, we got some expectations. Truth is that when I look by all means to our nations in Central Europe, this is a true success story. Um, though we separated with Czechs, Czechoslovakia was on, on the top uh, among reforming nations. When we separated Slovakia, dropped behind 30% in GDP. We got some troubles in democracy. Uh, you remember Albright uh, labeling Slovakia, you know, or pointing Slovakia as a black hole of Europe, which we were at the time uh, after referendum. Um, in 97, we turned into black hole, deserving so. Um, we were not invited in Madrid, but nevertheless, we caught up. Uh, Slovakia is a true success story. Let me talk on behalf of Slovakia. I'm not because I'm paid by Slovak government. They don't pay me that, that well, you know. <laughs> uh, anyway, but uh, uh, this is not a complaint, uh, just an, a little s a footnote. Uh, uh, but in terms of GDP, we covered 30% uh, um, distance, which was kept by Czechs. Today, we are plus minus one to one. Uh, we are maybe 40 something percent of the average of Europe uh, on this solution. Today, we come to more than 80 percent. So we have almost come to uh, the average of EU. Uh, and if the continuation will be as we have it in the last 10 years, we will very soon reach the average of EU. Uh, we passed over some of the old EU members in these terms in the quality of life index. Uh, we are well, we are very close to the average of EU. Um, Poles, they did a marvelous job because they started at the level which was lower than Ukraine at the dissolution of uh, Soviet Union. And now they, they reached the level of Hungary and they are closing up uh, on Czechs and Slovaks. Uh, so region is, is doing very fine. Uh, we got free elections, we got governments which are freely elected. Whether they are good or bad, we choose them, you know, so what to complain about. Um, they could be better, they could, always life can be better, but we have to work what we've got. She didn't marry Marlon Brando, she married me, she have to live with me. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's it. Uh, um, EU was a such a success when you would look at that uh, monetary union, ever closer union. And though, you know, the, the title of my lecture was said that 
love and reason. It is a relationship. Transatlantic relations is love and reason. This few day, few days ago, before coming here, I was thinking I should change it maybe uh, to something more topical. I was thinking of a title. Um, you know, is it me who's going crazy, or you know, to make with an appropriate gesture, or what the shit is going on with this world? You know. Because it feels like uh, something is going on with this world which is absolutely irrational. Um, you know what was the most growing word in the recent couple of months? It was post-truth. So it was the word which was trending. It's called the trending words we use. And this is a good description of the world where we come. So when we speak of transatlantic as love and reason, uh, now we come to post-truth, which is a reason and irrationality. Uh, truth is that, even here in the United States, like call it in the liberal democratic world, in the Western world, we live unprecedented era. We are the most uh, advanced in technology. We are the most advanced in healthcare. We got the highest life uh, um, uh, expectancy. We live the longest. We live healthiest. Uh, we are the most prosperous in all history, definitely for Central Europe. I don't think that Slovaks has got any time in their history for whatever, 2,000 years, as we can call it. Uh, we can be that bold uh, that they were better off. Uh, uh, we are the most safe period of our, of our, of our life. Uh, we got the lowest crime. We got the lowest murder rate. Um, even car accidents are less than they used to be. Uh, so almost by all means, when you would look into reality of our life, we are in the best period of our life. Strangely, when you do polling and when you follow the political campaigns, you would think that what a shit we are living through. What a horror, you know. One would almost be afraid to wake up in the morning and turn on the cell phone because another horrible news falling on our head. When I got a cousin, we grew together. He's like my brother. He's a priest, Catholic priest. And he keep messaging me all these horrible stories of conspiracy stories and what the horrible things are going on. And the last message of him he said, well, I cannot stand living this life where, you know, so many horrible things are happening. Well, truth is, it's not what we think they are. So we come to the world where if you would have asked me uh, 27 years ago, let's say 26 years ago, that what this new brave world would look like and for what we dedicated all of our energy and all of our professional and private life to, what it will look like, well, I wouldn't, wouldn't have thought that we would come to the day uh, where post-truth, uh, where the lies and the hate would matter more than the truth uh, and, uh, and compassion and, uh, and tolerance. Uh, this is a strange thing. Even 2009 and yesterday, Pavel Demesh reminded me when I saw him at the embassy. Pavel invited me with him and with Iveta Radichova uh, at the 20th anniversary uh, of the fall of Berlin Wall. It's not a long time ago, 2009, 2016, it's seven years ago. It's not a long time. Uh, in the my life is not a long time. Your eye in your life is nothing. Uh, you still look very good, I have to tell you. Um, given the time went through, you know, and the substance which is on, on our shoulders. And we were going to Berlin in 2009 with Tina. Uh, and I told her, you know, I want to take you there because she was never uh, to Berlin before. And my was only encounter in, in Berlin was 87, I think, or what it was, 88. When I was going to the Netherlands for the scholarship, which I won, out of 10,000 students at the Communist University, there were nine of us who won there. It's not too much of a student exchange because today our kids, all of them, not, go not only going for two weeks or two months or three months or one semester, 
but full studies in the UK, France, United States, imagine, you know, it's all Cambridge seems to be full of Slovak students. Uh, at that time, this was very rare. And I, and I, before I went, I, I needed 11, that I remember, 11 stamps and signatures from most senseless offices you could imagine just to let me go through the border. I came to the border, they throw me off the train because they found in my school bag notes from Marx and Lenin, which, because this was my passion to chose the quotation, which were very much contradicting the regime we were living. And the guys just, just said, what, 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 what is this? You know, what do you have it for? I said, these are Lenin's quote, you know, this page, that, book, that. I said, well, you know, off, off the train. Suddenly, you know, there was good and bad cop. He said, okay, let him go. He said, no, he needs to tell us what is his intention. I said, well, there's nothing. He said, no, 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 you got something. He said, oh, let the boy go. And they finally, the train start uh, moving, and uh, I was running with my suitcases to catch it, and I went off in Berlin at Friedrichstrasse, and I moved to the post to change the train into West Berlin, and this was a, a light and dark. This was coming from a nightmare uh, to a light. And I even always used, we saw it in Devin Castle, these gun posts and dogs, but there was very physical thing. A, a city separated by wall, by gun posts, by dogs, barking on you, and I look at it, what a weird reality we are going through uh, here. And here I rewind the movie, we in 2009, which is not a long time from 89, this was 20 years, it's not too long time, 20 years. We sat in Bratislava into our uh, new uh, nice Mercedes Benz. Uh, we drove on a smooth highway from Bratislava to Brno, Prague, non-stop. We come to German border, nothing, no border. We come on highway in Berlin, look and hit the speed. Finally, enjoy the fast car. In five and a half, you Berlin. You buy a hotel in Berlin, you go for dinner, and you feel, and here I am. I'm, I'm a European citizen, I feel equal. I'm I feel equal, I feel physically and mentally equal man, 20 years. And I have to tell you that it felt very, very good. Um, and I'm not saying just to uh, make any, any statement uh, of this, but just say that seems like today we are forgetting very much where we were and what we achieved, like we're losing self-confidence uh, of what we achieved. Like we do not trust and we liberal democracy, its value on its own, and as Churchill said, it may be the hell, but out of all other hells, this may be the best one to live in. But it requires your work, your dedication. Uh, freedom fight is never done, because uh, Peter yesterday uh, greeted me and, and Pavel is freedom fighting. I say, well, I hope this is not becoming any soon too physical. Uh, but the fight, it's, uh, it's never done. Uh, and it's always about your contribution, not about the entitlement, but about uh, your hard work. So today's reality, and uh, I'll say a couple of words on today's realities, um, and then maybe I'll stop and I'll, I'll be very much looking forward for questions because this is always my most, most preferred time of the speeches. By the way, I hate speeches like this. Uh, well, I'll go through until the questions. Uh, Central Europe, as I said, is a success story, but today's reality, what it is. Still, there is um, a level of corruption and feeling of injustice uh, among people, which is too strong, and people are getting more and more cynical. That with political changes, we are not, um, and I'm not saying specifically about Slovakia, this applies to a number of countries in the region, that this justice and what people would expect, the fairness of the society, it's still not here at the level uh, we should say. Emotion prevails. Uh, now emotion takes over the ration. What we see as, see as a new phenomena uh, in the last couple of years, this is a growing uh, information war waged by Russians. Um, and it's quite intense. Uh, and uh, it's quite rude. Uh, we see a um, region getting into a certain level of instability when we look at uh, Ukraine, uh, Crimea, Donbass, uh, when we see how uh, how unhappy and how unsafe our Baltic friends feel, uh, you don't, it doesn't add to a, a feeling of safety and security in the region. 
Uh, in EU, we see strange things happening. Uh, it seems like uh, a new elites are forgetting what was EU for. Now we got more talk about the money and the uh, EU funds and uh, fiscal uh, uh, horizons and budgets. You know, we all tend to forget uh, that EU was not formed uh, because of euro funds uh, and, 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 and whatever uh, would comes there uh, that you draw from. But EU was an elite project uh, by <coughs> politicians who wanted to make Europe safe and stable. It was found in the late uh, 40s, uh, early 50s, on the ashes of very, very bad war. And European Union was first of all a security project, together with NATO, both as a sister and brother, or father and mother, what that would be, uh, a family concept. And now, this is all like forgotten, evaporated, uh, like the values which were granted and given, they are no values anymore. I was horrified to follow the, uh, the referendum in the Netherlands, which turned out to be part of Russian information war, uh, the post-truth campaign, uh, the hate campaign, where many proxy wars uh, were fought, uh, and the result uh, was just bad. But when we got Brexit, and we kept telling Cameron's people a long time ago, don't do it. He said, well, I have to do it. It will be fine. I have handle. You know, I, I have a grip on that. This cannot go wrong. We told him it can go wrong. And what it, it, if it gets out of control? And it got out of control. And it served as a horrible platform for hate, for lies. And now you wake up another day and the people say, oh shit, what happens? You know, what are we going to do? But day before was, let's have fun, you know. Let's throw it uh, once again, you know, in this slot machine. We will see where we get. And they got bingo. Um, and they don't know what to do with bingo, you know employ 30,000 people to get out of the Brexit uh, in a good way? Well, I don't know. Here in the string of events, uh, we will see repeated election in Austria. Debate is just horrible. Uh, Italy on the short list. Uh, France, what a boost Le Pen got. Uh, Germany, I don't know how this will go. Uh, I very much like Merkel. I think she was a great leader. But God knows uh, what is going to be here. In our region, uh, I'm, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. You would have to ask me. I don't, I'm not going there. Um, U.S., and here I stop. Um, and we spoke a little bit in the office before coming up here. Um, I was here in first, I came here in the first Bush presidency then was during the campaign, second Bush term, until the mid-presidential campaign, and I just left before the election where Obama was elected. To me, even that campaign, Obama, first Obama campaign, was highly divisive. Actually, second Bush campaign was pretty divisive. On Iraq war, the climate, either you with me or you hate America, this was too much. Uh, and I think he did go a little too far, dividing Americans. Those who support me in Iraq or they don't like America. This was a first very divisive campaign. But then Trump campaign was also not very much, mm, you know, uniting. Uh, it was quite socialistic, if I should be blunt. Uh, but first of all, raising expectations to the level where you know, when all of us knew that his expectations cannot be delivered. So we got into kind of a spin in the United States, which more and more divides the nation, where people get very emotional. We used to have that in Slovakia. I thought you are more immune for that, but we used to have that during Mechiar days. Family hated each other. A half family who were from Mechiar and the other part of the family which was against, they didn't talk to each other. They, they couldn't go for family gathering because they, it would end up in bad quarrels. Sometimes I'll feel like America got into a point where division, division is too strong, and what you were s strong before for, which I always admired and always was telling in Europe, we should take an example of bipartisanship, at least on the key areas of foreign policy, security, and others. You know, We can quarrel on many things, but bipartisanship, or in Europe terms, multipartisanship, should be on our core values and our core interests. 
seems like that is gone. That is gone also here. Um, I don't, I'm not going to bitch about Trump and his campaign. No, don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, I think uh, we, 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 need no, we need anything more than being hysterical th these days. He always bread is never eaten that warm as it's taken out of the uh, oven. So uh, we will see. We will see what we get. But what makes me nervous, and this is my concluding note uh, here, um, maybe two things. Uh, first thing, uh, I don't think that there is a concession in that, and we would say, don't look at my campaign. It might have been horrible. And um, this is not applying to Trump campaign. This is applying to Brexit, Netherlands campaign, many election campaigns in, 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 in Europe. <coughs> don't look at the campaign. Look how will be the policies. I say, you know, give me a break. In church, I'm Catholic. We pray every Sunday. God, my brothers and sisters, I have to admit I committed many sins with my thoughts, my words, my deeds, and for what uh, uh, I have failed to do. So how on the earth, we know for more than 2,000 years that the consistency is extremely important for our life. How could I do good deeds if I will have bad thoughts? Or how a life can be better if I say rubbish and then I say, well, I, you know, this I didn't mean. This was only for the campaign. Don't, don't look at that, you know, but I mean, it, I'll do it differently. I think we, we should get out of this strange loop and should come back to normal consistency that this is the thought what we have. They become our words and our words become our action. And we should also forget that there is a list of things we should do. And if we don't do those, uh, we may fail. These are important. We may, we should remember there are good things we have to do. If we don't do it, we fail. Second thing, and this is about my lecture, Love and Reason. Love and Reason uh, was born, uh, which is transatlantic. It always worked both ways. It was not that it was our, our love and their reason and vice versa. This was always that we profited from that, but we enjoyed those values and vice versa. Every new president should remember if United States will forget about Europe, it will come back in a very reasonable way and that there will be price to be paid by Americans. But also, we should remember that this is a joint heritage which binds us through people like you who are sitting in this room, devoted transatlanticists, because this is part of your heritage and part of your devotion. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been speaking for longer than I thought. Uh, 35 minutes. So I apologize and uh, I'm ready to take any questions in the most candid and open manner I, my position will uh, enable me. Maybe I'll sit down for the questions if, if it's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for these uh, very personal reflections on the uh, long road since 1989 to the post truth. Uh, era. Uh, I have lots of questions, but we are, in fact, um, uh, quickly running out of time, and we have a little ceremony at the end, I understand, uh, to take care of as well. So um, we have just about 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes for Q&A. So I'll, I'll uh, hold off and invite you for your comments and, and questions. Um, so the floor, floor is open. Why don't we take um, the first round of, of, of comments or questions? Anyone? Yes, and if you could please wait for the microphone and identify yourself. Yes. Hello, my name is Marina Rudenka. I'm from Ukraine. Uh, I'm a short-term uh, Wilson Center um, uh, fellow. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency, uh, for reminding that the situation in Ukraine uh, caused this war uh, with Russia. And um, I, I would like to ask you about um, uh, how to uh, Ukraine uh, keep uh, uh, attention and um, uh, unity of uh, European Union countries related um, uh, the sanctions, economic sanc sanctions uh, against Russia. And uh, uh, you uh, 
<coughs> told about uh, a lot uh, of uh, threats related to uh, the next year elections uh, in France uh, and Germany, uh, how to uh, remind uh, effectively about uh, the main points uh, of uh, uh, European Union, uh, as you said, uh, I it was uh, uh, safety, security and the values uh, of uh, democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, why don't you go ahead and answer that. All right. Uh, I'm very sorry where Ukraine got to, and and, uh, and I think this is absolutely inexcusable uh, policy uh, by today's Kremlin, uh, where Ukraine it got. And it actually is reflected in the EU sanctions, and it's reflected by a clear uh, position by uh, EU institutions as such and by NATO. Uh, we never recognized, uh, in, and I don't think we will recognize, uh, the takeover of Crimea. Uh, I, I don't think this is going to happen. Uh, and uh, I even don't think that we are going to change our approach to sanctions, because when I follow the debate which is going on now within the uh, European Council, and Slovakia is now holding the presidency, um, there is a clear uh, dedication, though you find leaders who question uh, the efficiency of sanctions, of course, and it's legitimate debate. Uh, but at the end, I don't think that EU will change uh, on its policies on sanctions. Even I, I think there, there is a lot of uh, voices which we hear that uh, these sanctions should toughen up a little bit uh, if things would uh, worsen. Uh, so I would not be too much worried today uh, about uh, uh, the continuity of sanctions. I, I don't see any any mood which would change anytime soon. So I would say at least for additional six months, I don't see any, at least for that, uh, I don't see any any mood for change in the approach. Uh, there is some good news for Ukraine, because I'm glad recently uh, we approved uh, uh, a regime, a visa waiver regime for Ukraine, which is good news. It's not immediately for tomorrow, but it, it's going to happen. Uh, we we should introduce something like uh, United States did during my time with ESTA um, regime. So we will have an instrument which will make it technically uh, easier uh, for nations like Ukraine to get into this visa-free regime, which I think is very encouraging. Though I understand it's very hard for Ukrainian leadership today uh, to keep uh, uh, spirits and to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, it's very hard. Uh, it's very hard for them. So. And I often think uh, that, well, the last thing today I would want to be would be the Ukraine Minister of Foreign Affairs or Defense. That is a, uh, this is a hard job. But uh, you got sympathy uh, and support, uh, I understand, here uh, on the other side of Atlantic. Uh, and I would not be hysterical about whatever was said in the campaign. We will see, you know, what will be the practical policies. And uh, here I would doubt it would be very much different as it was, as it what, it what it used to be. So. Um, in, in the campaign, uh, we see dirty campaigns in, in Europe. We see a lot of um, strong uh, in information war and influence making uh, paid often, uh, uh, well, from, from Kremlin. Uh, a lot of extremist parties get support, uh, and they are part of the information war. So I'm just hoping that... Uh, the reason will prevail uh, in the side of Europe because uh, it's easy math uh, to do. It's, it's very easy math to do. So, but well, we live it as and again, and I have no explanation. We live in the time which is very, very irrational, and which will be maybe very hard for some of the nations for some time. But I'm still hoping that first of all, lust for freedom will be here forever, and will prevail in sense of justice will be here forever and eventually at the end will prevail. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, all the way in the back. <coughs> Hello. My name is Daniel Buti. We had a question from Ukraine. Let's have one from Romania. I'm from Romania, mm. not uh, actually Central Europe. By my question um, uh, relates equally to Central and uh, Eastern Europe. 
Um, I've noticed that there are many questions and a lot of uh, uncertainty, uncertainty, sorry, about the position the new administration in Washington will have related to Eastern and uh, Central Europe. Uh, do you think that there will be major changes in this position? Thank you. Thanks. I hope not, and I don't think so, uh, for many reasons. Uh, Central and Eastern Europe, it's part of NATO, it's part of the EU. Uh, we are part of the family. Uh, if a uh, new administration should give up on the part of the family, uh, I don't think that the rest of the family will work. So uh, if you will give up on Baltics, if you will give up on the flank countries like uh, Romania, uh, Bulgaria, or even Slovakia, you know, you, you kill the system. And I don't think there will be anybody here uh, ripe mentally to to pull the trigger to kill the system. I, I don't think so. I don't think that there was uh, anybody fool enough uh, to be part of that type of an administration here. Second, uh, I still trust in the um, in that old bipartisan uh, strong group, which in the old days Bruce Jackson used to call and please take it with the mild and very friendly connotation. Bruce called it the NATO mafia. And this was only a, a kind of um, a macho label uh, for a group of people who understand uh, what are the security challenges and what we should do just to have a rightful uh, survival instinct. So out of new administration, I will uh, expect nothing else only to continue in the normal survival instincts. What Trump was saying actually in the campaign, uh, uh, I would subscribe to, uh, to one thing, and that is that we should take more responsibility. And again, uh, if this was love and reason, on that reason part, we should be also reasonable, and we should not create a climate that we free ride on the security, and we also always would have an expectations that here is the big brother who would help us when shit happens, uh, and then only we, you know, we would sit down and wait uh, until that. So uh, I, I think we should seriously wake up. In Central Europe, uh, with the exception of Poland, we dropped dramatically uh, in our defense capabilities. Uh, and uh, but even in the West, look at Germany. Uh, they, they were below one percent GDP on a very low scale of capabilities, etc. So, I think we should we should sit down. One thing: what we should do with new administration is to have a, a normal, non-emotional, very rational debate, sitting down at one table and saying where we are, uh, what is the bottom line, what we got, uh, and what we can do, everything about the bottom line. So we have a sane and, and, and healthy uh, transatlantic relationship which will keep us stronger, not weaker. Thank you. One more very short question, very short answer, and then we'll have to bring this. Mm -hmm. yes. um, Ambassador, uh, welcome to Washington again. My name is Frank Safertal. I am with the uh, Czechoslovak Society of Arts and Sciences. One of the things that you did not mention in your speech is the role and the future of the Visegrad Four. Uh, could, you, could you just briefly talk about the Visegrad Four, its purpose and its future? Uh, now, we heard recently that Austria is potentially joining Visegrad Four, so could you just comment on that? Thank yeah. you. All of that in 30 seconds. <laughs> um, Visegrad was actually a project which was inspired uh, here from the United States and from Western parts. This was these Albrights and Jasinskis uh, and their counterparts in the West which said, well, you know, before we invite you to join NATO and EU, why wouldn't you prove that you can work uh, on this regional level and prove that you will be a constructive part of our endeavor? Truth is that Visegrad uh, worked. I'm very proud of its achievements uh, for the 20 years. Uh, today, it's a working body, not bureaucratic. Before every EU council, there is a meeting, coordination meeting. Slovakia is today is the only part which is in the Eurozone, so we serve as a little bit, you know, kind of a reconnaissance unit out there, which helps uh, Visegrad. Today, of course, you know, Visegrad goes through some upsides, ups, ups and downs, uh, frankly. Uh, we may not agree on everything, but here I say, bottom line for us, it's here and it, and it works. We start in Visegrad with the things where we have the common views and that we advocate and we go further. We don't start on things where we differ. And I think this changed the culture in the region 
which is helping us. And we make things where we don't agree. And, and we have meetings where prime ministers, four prime ministers and foreign ministers sit. You would be surprised by honesty and sometimes by some small clashes. But what comes out uh, is that we have a lot of in common and we try to advocate. One thing, the last, my footnote is that I hope very much for myself and for the diplomat and for, for somebody who works for the government that Visegrad would be very constructive uh, element, not a destructive element. So Visegrad will in the future be not only the one who comes and breaks the table or you know throws the glass, uh, but somebody who will come and say, this we don't like, this is the policy proposal what we should do because we care about the bigger picture. Thank you. Thank you very much for these enlightening remarks, Ambassador Kutcher. And I think now we have a little ceremony um, to take place. So thank you. But let's first give a round of applause for Ambassador Kutcher. Yeah. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But this is different. This is this was different. Different, different occasion. This this is a medal, a picturing of General uh, Stephanie yes. uh, with the American eagle on the back of it, and we are delighted, and we are delighted to present you with the uh, Friends of Slovakia Medal of Honor. Thank you very much. Uh, when you will look at Milan Rastislav Stefani, when when you will look at n my name. When you see how my parents were very much patriotic and how much my, uh, they admired uh, people like him. So I'll, I'll have it with pride and I'll display it in my uh, private office cabinet. So um, thank you very much. And the transatlantic relations, you know, that will be very much still on <laughs> your shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, my name is Tom Dine president of the American Friends of the Czech Republic, and I have a son-in-law named Stefanik. <laughs> He's a Ruthenian, uh, three times removed. Uh, the American Friends joins the Friends of Slovakia in congratulating you and, and presenting you uh, with all kinds of nice things. Uh, but I'd just like to more be more personal. I was listening for love and, and reason and uh, we all know we live in a society of not so much love and not so much reason. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and of course, we all worship liberalism in the broad Western sense, but we're facing illiber illiberalism, uh, particularly in Hungary and places like that. Having said that, I'm glad you are so blunt, frank, and care about these things deeply. So on behalf of our two organizations, a certificate awarded to the ambassador, and it's signed by Joe Schenko and myself as our the two presidents. And uh, I took from I'm going to take from your comments, particularly your spontaneous ones. I love the one that said "lust for freedom." Man, you got it right there. <laughs> so thank you. And this is my colleague uh, Barbara. Uh, give me, and she's our treasure. So that's the most important yeah. thing of all. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're adjourned. Thank you.